the Gospel of John, chapter 3, starting with verse 22. John, chapter 3, verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anan near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown in prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all were coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, he, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And we know once again and we pray that God may bless the reading of his holy word this morning. Now we continue through our study of John, chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, Last week, I made the statement at the sermon, I was not thinking, and I saw the end of verse 21 with the the red letters ending, and I thought for some reason that was the end of the chapter, and I mentioned that Lord willing, we'd finish the chapter today, being, being last week, and I looked out on the congregation, I saw the look of consternation, I'm thinking, you're thinking, what's going on here? Are we going to cover this entire section, which would have been a rather lengthy section? Either I was going to go very quickly, or we would have been here a very long time. And then after I was finished with the sermon and I looked down, I realized, wait a minute, there's another chapter, or another section to the chapter, and that's where we will begin this week. So, Lord willing, today we will finish chapter 3. But let's ask the Lord's help as we open his holy word this morning. Our Father and our God, we do ask, Lord, for your assistance as we open your word. Lord, we recognize that through your word, you speak to us. We pray now for help to understand. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts. Reveal to us the truths that you have us to understand. Help us to live these truths, to apply them to our lives. May your Holy Spirit do his work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked at the very familiar passage last week of John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, and we saw that in connection with the rest of the chapter, John chapter 3, verse 7, I believe, 3, verse 3, where it says, you must be born again. And we talked about that, and we talked about the discussion with Nicodemus, that uh, we were concluding that with with that section of John where Jesus had taught, Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night uh, asking him a question, actually asking the question in such a way that it is not recorded, as Jesus answered his question, his unspoken question, in the rest of the chapter of his need as a religious man, a very religious man coming to the Lord, he needed to be born again. And we concluded that with John chapter 3, verse 16 down through verse 21 talking about the love of God as displayed to the world, that God so loved the world. That is, God so loved the race of man, mankind in general. His love is displayed through the giving of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
apart from Christ, you have only what we call the general love of God or the common grace of God. God, because he is love, he is kind and gracious to all human beings, regardless of their state with him, whether he is, whether they are a child of his or whether they are his enemy. He loves all in that sense. He gives reign to the just and to the unjust. His general care and kindness is showered upon all of mankind. Everybody, in some sense, enjoys the blessings of God. They sit down and eat a, a meal. They enjoy the love of family and friends. All of that is given out of God's common grace to mankind and His love. But that's as far as it goes for those who do not know Jesus Christ. There is a general care and kindness of God. There is an offer of the gospel to all. Jesus Christ is offered to all human beings without distinction. That's the love of God. But without Christ, no one benefits from the saving love of God that's reserved for his people. We talked about that from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. There's a special love of God for his children. And we talked about that in Romans chapter 8. We won't turn there. But verses 33 through 39 talk about the inseparable love of God, love of Christ in God that's found in God for his people. That nothing can separate them from him. Famine or sword or peril or whatever difficulties. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ. But those... Outside of Christ, for those you find no such love. John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So when we talk about the love of God to the world, the love of God is revealed in the offer of Christ to the world. Those who reject that offer remain under the wrath of, of God under the condemnation of God. That thought then is continued as we go into this next section. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 sets us up for the rest of the chapter. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now after these things, these things were Jesus' cleansing of the temple. He went into Jerusalem. He went into the temple. He found those selling doves and changing money in this court of the Gentiles, which was reserved for worship. The Jewish authorities had permitted the merchants to come in and make that section of worship for the Gentiles a place of business. Jesus drove them out. He made a cord drove them out, the money changers, those selling the doves, and the animals drove them all out in a very orderly fashion. This showing, we talked about that, his great divine power, because here we have one man with just simply a cord driving out thousands from the temple itself. He did that, and then we find him discussing with Nicodemus by night these many spiritual concepts. We spent much time on that, the new birth. And after that, Jesus left Jerusalem, the city, and goes into the countryside of Judea, and he spends time with his disciples. Now, the word remain there in verse 22 is a very interesting word. And what it means literally is to rub off or to rub hard. And what it means actually is Jesus spent time rubbing off on the disciples. Now, it was probably several months, and and we know, remember, whenever the disciples, after Jesus had ascended, Uh, He had risen from the grave and ascended into heaven. The disciples, the apostles went out preaching and the Jewish authorities did not know what to do with them. They said, what's going on? We thought we solved this problem with the crucifixion of Christ and now we have many of them. What happened here? And they realized, oh, these are unlearned and ignorant men, but (laughs) they were with Jesus. That's what happened here. There was a rubbing off of Jesus onto the disciples. That's what he was doing. He was teaching them and showing himself to them during this time of several months. He was baptizing. Now he was performing here the same baptism of repentance that John did, calling people to repentance. Although we find in chapter 4, verse 2, that Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples baptized. Now his disciples did not teach. They weren't prepared to teach yet at this point, but they were able to baptize. Now the reason Jesus did not baptize was, you find in 1 Corinthians 1, that some people were 
saying, well, I was baptized by Paul or I was baptized by, by Paulus or whatever. There's a spiritual pride that would be involved there. And Jesus did not want any of that. And so his disciples baptized, not he himself. John the Baptist had moved away from Bethany beyond the Jordan to Anon near Salim. We find that in verse 23. He continued his ministry there and he was baptizing in a different location now. Now, the much water, if you notice there in verse 23, because there was much water there, does not necessarily imply that he was immersing, although Baptists will point this out, and, you know, but we have to just look at what the scripture says. Much water there means many waters. That is, there was many springs in this area. So it wasn't talking about the depth of the water or anything like that. We're talking about the abundance of water. And for a time... We see Jesus and his ministry expanding, and we see John's ministry going on simultaneously. John came proclaiming the Messiah. He's pointing to the Messiah, and he continues to do that as Jesus' ministry begins to grow, and his ministry then begins to decline. Because what happened? Well, you have all these crowds coming for John. Jesus is in obscurity. He's still a carpenter. He is still doing his work with, in, in his father's house with, with, uh, with what he, whatever he was doing there. Uh, he then is called out for the ministry. He's baptized by John and his ministry begins. Now at that time, you, all the crowds were with John. Jesus begins his ministry. He begins cleansing the temple. He has that time with the Nicodemus and he goes out performing miracles and teaching, healing all of that. And you have a great expansion of the Lord's ministry. And what you can picture here is, if you remember, for 400 years in the land of Israel, there was no prophet. There was darkness. And then all of a sudden you have one bright star, one star star begins to shine. John the Baptist and his preaching. But as he's preaching, he's proclaiming the coming Messiah. The coming Messiah is the sun that is now rising. What happens to the star in the night sky as the sun begins to rise? The star begins to fade away. Now, I remember as a kid spending the night outside just, just with a friend in a friend's yard. We'd sit up and look at the stars. Sometimes we'd stay up all night, which I don't recommend you know, for kids. You know, parents. We, we say, no, you go to sleep, but kids do it. You know that. So we're watching the stars fading, and here comes the sun Rising. And this is what was happening to the, to the ministry of John. Jesus' ministry is beginning to expand. John's ministry is begin, beginning to fade away. His message was, Behold the Lamb of God, pointing to the Messiah. And as the Messiah began to make his entrance, John began to pass off the scene. Now his disciples here seem to have missed this message. And they were focusing on the man, on John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a great man. We know that. And his ministry continued even after he was put into prison and he was beheaded. His disciples still considered themselves disciples of John. We find them in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark and the book of Luke, all three other Gospels. They pop up on occasion. Uh, The topic of fasting was brought up and John's disciples and the Pharisees wondered why the disciples of Jesus didn't fast like they did. So we have them there. And then in Acts chapter 19... We have a group of John's disciples who are saved and rebaptized in the name of Jesus. They didn't even know anything about the Holy Spirit. There was, there was a certain ignorance about them. They knew the baptism of John. They were John's disciples. And for probably 200 years, there was large sections of people who considered themselves converts of John. And even to this day, there's some dispute about this. I was looking on the Internet. I found a group of believers of something that consider themselves disciples of John the Baptist. They practice a spiritual type of baptism. They have many strange beliefs. They don't consider themselves Christians. They don't consider themselves Jews, but they're in Iraq and Iran. Now, the recent problems over there, the violence over there has driven them all over the world. They are diminishing. But even to this day, there are people who would consider themselves disciples of John that aren't disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John's ministry is diminishing at this point. And what we have, verse 26, or verse 25, we have a dispute 
between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now, there's some textual issues about this. Some think it's just a single person. Others think there were several of the several Jews that came. But what there, what happened here? There was some argument between John's disciples and the Jews, and this is the matter about of baptism. Now, what we this argument was, we don't know. But somewhere in this argument, this particular person or this group of people pointed out that wait a minute. You're arguing all this about purification. Look at your master's ministry. Look at John's ministry. It's, it's falling apart. You know, uh, everyone's going to Jesus. At this point, John's disciples had no answer. So they went to John. They said, there's, there's a problem here. And they brought up the fact to John that Jesus' ministry is expanding. Look, look at verse 26. And they came to John. That's the disciples of John. Came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. They said, there's a problem, John. So what's happening to your ministry? Your ministry, the, you know, this, this man pointed out, your ministry is fading, and it is. There's less people here now than what there was before. More people are following after Jesus, and we're just fading away. There was, in the, this group of disciples... There was what we would call a spiritual jealousy that had set in among them. They resented seeing the crowds leave them and go to Jesus. And there, notice how this jealousy plays out and how they describe Jesus. They did not use the name of Jesus. They said, this man that you pointed to uh, in, in Jordan, the one that you were talking about, you know, his ministry is expanded. They didn't use his name. This points out a couple of things that we have to guard against in the ministry. One thing is that we must not make too much of the minister. Now look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We talked about this when we went through Corinthians a while back. But just as a reminder, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. And I mentioned this. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? There's a certain cliquish type of jealousy that's going on in the Corinthian church, and they were gathering around different ministers. We have to guard against the idea of making too much of any minister. There's a natural tendency toward this, as we see here. These men knew that John was a good man. He was a great preacher. There was none greater than he. We find Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. He was a, the greatest of all prophets. Now, why was he so great? Well, the prophets before him said there's a Messiah coming. The prophets after him the preachers after him, such as myself, say there came Jesus. There was a time when Jesus came. John himself was the lone prophet who said he is here now. He was the greatest of, of all prophets. But he was still a man. There's a danger of exalting man more than what he should be exalted. You know, we need to respect those who give you the word of God. We're told to do that. However, we are not to exalt them above where they are. You know, I was in a ministry for a while, and now I look back on it, I can describe it as not much more than a cult. It was considered a fundamentalist type of ministry. And not all fundamentalists are the same, obviously. In this ministry, the, the pastor was very much exalted. For special days, they would give out prizes for people to try to get them to come to church. And some of these prizes may, were coffee mugs, that had the preacher's picture on them. You know, or, or napkins, or, or uh, not napkins, what would you call the thing you blow your nose in? Whatever, a tissue, or not a tissue. Handkerchief. I haven't had one for so long in my pocket, I forget what they're called. But they'd have handkerchiefs with his picture on it. Now there'd be a Bible verse or something, but there was this great idea, this man is somehow spiritually exalted above the rest of us. Folks, I am no more 
or no less than what you are. I'm a human being. And John had an answer for all of this. Well, that's one danger, but the other is there's this idea of ministries competing against each other. Now, we don't really have a church down the street. The closest church is something very different. You have a Roman Catholic church, and I think a Greek Orthodox church. You have to go a long ways the other direction to find a church like ours. Uh, there are some churches like ours. Uh, but do we, are, we, are we competing against them? You know, there's this idea sometimes that, okay, well, you know, look, look how many people we have as opposed to how many people they have. Or this ministry is expanding, this ministry is not. There's this idea of competition. Now, if a church holds true doctrine, um, a lot of churches don't, so we are in competition with them for the souls of men. But those who do hold the same doctrine as us, we believe the scriptures, we believe uh, in, in the basic doctrines of Christ together, we're not in competition. If they're being blessed, then we, are, we ought to be thankful for that rather than have a jealousy towards that or a competition towards that. But John's response to all of this We find verse 27. He gives us an answer. How do you deal with this? Verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. John says that anything that we have, including a ministry, comes from heaven. It is God who establishes the ministry of any individual. He places him where he desires. He calls him. He places him where he desires. He grants certain gifts to this individual that this person can perform the duties that he needs to perform. He grants whatever successes there are or what appears to be failures. Not every minister is called to be a Charles Spurgeon or a George Whitfield. If you look in the history of these men, you find thousands flocking to their ministries. George Whitfield went up and down the coast of the United States, the colonies at the time. Thousands upon thousands of people were converted under his ministry. Not everyone's like that. Some are like an Adoniram Judson, who is called to minister in Burma. And the first 18 years of his ministry, I'm sorry, the first 12 years of his ministry, he had 18 converts in 12 years. Some are called to different types of work. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? If there's any blessings in your ministry, there's nothing special about it. You received it from the Lord. 1 Corinthians fifteen ten. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Any result in the ministry is God's grace. If you find people being convicted under your ministry, you're repenting and coming to the Lord, it's the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Notice the, 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 the thread through all these verses. It's all from above. Anything that the minister is able to do comes from above. It is nothing from within himself. And if it is, there's a problem there that needs to be dealt with and gotten rid of. 1 Timothy 1.12 And I thank God, I'm sorry, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me in the ministry. And 1 Timothy 2.7 For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Both the man and the ministry are appointed by God. God raises up the man, God empowers the man, and God places him where he wants him to go. The entire focus of ministry is to exalt Jesus Christ. Look to verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness, this is John the Baptist, that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. My ministry, John says, is to go before the Christ and prepare the way for him. It's not to exalt myself. He's saying, have not you listened to me? I've been preaching this same message. You have not heard this. There he is. All I am is a voice. He told that to the Pharisees. And then he goes on to illustrate that with the bridegroom. Verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. And remember, 
Who is the bride in the spiritual sense? It's the church. John went out preparing the church for the coming Messiah, preparing the bride, the church, for the Messiah. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John found his great joy in presenting the bride to the bridegroom. God's people, the church, he said, calling out to them, here he is, come to him. Bringing the, that, and that's what they actually did in those days. Now, Judea and Galilee had different types of marriage traditions. But in one tradition, they would, the, the bridegroom would bring the bride to, to the bridegroom, or I'm sorry, the best man would bring the, the bride to the bridegroom. And that's what John is pointing to. That's my job. Such a ministry has a time stamp. You know, I had a, a best man in my wedding. He's my brother. He's not best man anymore. That was 30 some odd years ago. There's a time stamp to this. You know, you're not a, bro- a best man doing that work forever. You have a limited amount of time. Look at verse 30. This verse should be plastered right across this pulpit right here. Okay, look at verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's what John is saying. Jesus Christ must increase. I must fade away. That's the goal of every minister of God. You know, if you walk out, you say, oh, wasn't Jeff Dollar wonderful today? Folks, I want to crawl under a pew and die. If that's your idea, if that's what you take from this message today. But what you need to be thinking is, isn't Jesus Christ glorified today? Isn't he wonderful? And that's the goal of every minister. He must increase, but I must decrease. There are limitations to the work of the minister. He's a sinner. And all he does is present the sinless one to the congregation. After John introduced the Lord Jesus Christ, his ministry was complete. Out of necessity, he must decrease. And that's exactly what was happening. He said, look, we knew this from the very beginning. His disciples are saying, what's going on, John? You knew this. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you see this? John, In John, you find the perfect example of humility. There is no rivalry. There's no envy. He is joyful at the success of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we find his closing thoughts in verse 31 through 36. He says, He who comes from above, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, is above all. The main center of attention must be on him who is from heaven. Don't focus upon him who is from the earth. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Always keep your attention on he who comes from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. John says, what's all this fuss about? Focus on him. Forget about me. Remember John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He is God come in human flesh. Look to him. Don't look to me. Job 25 we read. Let me turn back there again and just remind you of the last two verses. This is not very popular today. You will not find it in any self-esteem curriculum of any school. If even the moon does not shine, that's to God. God's brightness is so great, the, the light of the moon does nothing. And the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man who is a maggot. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Think about that for a minute. A maggot. And, the son, and a son of man who is a worm. Folks, we don't like to think these thoughts. We like to think highly of ourselves. You know, but you know what? Ultimately, we go to the same place as the, as the maggots. We turn to dust. We're human beings. We are worse than maggots because we are sinners. John says, don't ever forget that. I am just a fellow maggot. 
What you hear from Christ and his book is from the Lord of heaven, is from the creator. Focus on him. Don't focus on me who am but a maggot. Everything is to be focused upon the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, at, look back to John chapter 3. 32. And what he has seen, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and heard, that he testifies. In other words, he's from heaven. He is bringing you the message of heaven directly from heaven. However, no one receives his testimony. And what does John mean by that? Well, there were some that did. But this is what you would call a hyperbolic statement. In other words, it's an exaggeration for a purpose. In general, the gospel message is rejected. You give the, the preaching of the word out, people laugh at it, walk away, ignore it, walk away. But there are exceptions, and that's those who do receive the message. And those who do, verse 33... He who has received his testimony, that's the Lord's testimony, has certified that God is true. So if you believe the words of Jesus Christ, you certify, you put your seal on this, that you believe what God said is true. Now, if you reject Jesus Christ, you reject the word of God. There's no alternative. You know, some people think there's many ways to God. You know, you'll find that on, preached almost anywhere. That's not true. There is one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. You believe in what he said. You put your seal on the fact that, that you believe the truth of God. And then we, we close out with the absolute superiority of Jesus Christ over all. Verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. Now remember... I'm a fellow maggot. I have sin. So any work of the Holy Spirit that's done through me is going to have limitations because of my sin. Jesus Christ is sinless. In his work and in his words, the Spirit works without measure. There's no limit to the work of the power of the Holy Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is absolutely superior Look to verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. All power is given unto Him in heaven and earth, we are told in the Great Commission. So unlike human vessels, He's unlimited. He has all power. There is no taint of sin. John tells his followers, you are focusing on the wrong man. You have missed my point entirely. And then he summarizes the rest of the chapter, or the, summarizes the entire chapter here in this verse, in verse 36, which is pretty much a repeat of what's already been said in previous places. He who believes in the Son, now this Son, this one who is, who is superior above all, absolutely superior, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, all that's written of Him, all that's said of Him in the Scripture, He's the Son of God, He is the virgin-born Son of God, He is the sinless, virgin-born Son of God coming down from heaven. You believe in Him. You obey Him. Jesus said, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. You love Him. You have, in the present reality, eternal life. Eternal life does not begin when you die. Eternal life you possess when you know Jesus Christ. Because what happens? We have this life, which is temporary. We then have Jesus Christ in this life. We come to the point where this life ends. However, the life continues after death. Because it's a, it's a present reality. And this concept of having Jesus Christ means having eternal life is constantly repeated throughout the New Testament. He is our only righteousness before God. You want to stand before God uncondemned? You want God to look at you and say, I can receive you as you are. You can do that only because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
You can do that only because He is your propitiation for sin. That is, He bore the full brunt of God's wrath on your sin. You have His righteousness. You then stand before God forgiven because you have His blood upon you. That's the only hope that you have. John chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. You have that promise that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you possess eternal life. But there's another side to that. Verse 36. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You say, wait a minute, I'm alive now. I'm enjoying my life without Jesus Christ. You are enjoying your life of death. All that you have in this life is eternal death, condemnation. And you are living under the mercy of God, in a sense. So God has stepped back for a little while. And he's allowed you to go, to go on in your sin. He is being merciful because there's an opportunity for you to repent now. But when that life does come to an end, there is no eternal life. Revelation 21 and verse 8. Death is the only option to those who reject Jesus Christ. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you remain as you are. How are you? You are born into this world condemned under the wrath of God for sin. As soon as our feet hit the ground, we are running towards sin. We love sin, we embrace sin, we search after sin. And we have the just condemnation of God. If we do not believe in Jesus Christ, we remain as we are under that condemnation. The word remain there, or uh, the wrath of God abides on him, is the word, another word for remain. In the original language, it means to continually abide, or that it is your ever-present companion. If you are without Jesus Christ, you have rejected Jesus Christ. You do not believe in Jesus Christ. Your ever-present companion is the wrath of God. You simply remain as you are. There is coming a time. Right now, we mentioned God's mercy is being extended to you in Jesus Christ. His wrath is being restrained for your opportunity to turn to the Son. But that will not always be the case. There is coming a time when the hand of God's mercy will be taken away and the full brunt of God's wrath will be unleashed on the sinner. That's what John is saying here. You have the absolute superiority of Jesus Christ. You must believe in Him. If you do not, the wrath of God remains on you. And it will be unleashed at a particular time of life, when life ends. Keep that in mind. And here's one final thought. I'm going to close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let's... Now for